The first poem I'm going to read, for that you should know that um, I'm South Asian. And um, if, if you're a South Asian writer, it's practically obligatory that at some point you write about arranged marriage. So this is my arranged marriage poem. And um, it's called Arranged Madness. First, the balding engineer from Karachi proposed. His picture made me think of a snow-peaked mountain I could never climb. So I said no and waited powdering my cheeks with blush. Next, a letter arrived from a Desi farmer in Kansas, also a photo of him standing by a truck. I shook my head. It was too much, even for a sass like me, so I waited and waited. Then an email from my aunt in Pakistan about the twins in Lahore, both Bollywood retro and successful, willing to move to Los Angeles. One of them could work, so I consulted my psychic cat therapist, a Persian gray, asking her to meow twice for a green light. But at the sight of their twin digital picture, she only licked a paw. To her, marriage was being fed by an obedient companion who served as cushion to her claw. So it was decided that my waiting to wed dress would be green, and instead I'd walk down a grocery aisle, pushing a cart, buying cans of fancy feast, and watching the morning news while doing leg lifts. Lying on the floor mat, I'd be taking a stand against arranged madness. This was my cat's logic, I knew. Despite my family's sadness at my single plight, I was reasonably certain that at the right time I'd log on to arrangedpackylove.com and, to my delight, find a cat-friendly brain surgeon who listened to Chopin and didn't mind that I'd never learned how to cook. He'd take one look at my thighs and we'd elope to San Francisco where we'd spend a week restaurant hopping, shopping for an argument that Lily would dismiss with a wave of her paw. Um, this next poem was, it's sort of about how all things South Asian are, have become sort of trendy in the West and it's called um, Taj Mahal America. Welcome to Taj Mahal America. Asian-run motels and 7-Elevens, curry takeouts, and everyone knows when you dial tech support, they connect you to India. I've seen blonde women wear bindis, white men with henna tattoos, diplomats' wives getting their nose pierced on a Tuesday morning. Bombay sparks trends in the West where you can buy little elephant statues for yourselves, get frozen masala meals at Trader Joe's, I see it happen all week long. People get high on Bollywood songs, hookah bongs, novels about sati. Gurus talk karma and dharma and light a little incense. Sex can be yoga with your clothes off. Hippies, brown or white, eat mangoes and paint monsoon murals listening to Ravi Shankar. A little sitar makes third world America drunker. Rub some sesame oil on your skin before you log on to match.com. Fix a computer arranged marriage to someone named Epicurean. Speaking of which, South Asian weddings last too long. Five days with 5,000 guests flailing their arms in the air like they're playing rugby. Dablas on the knees of aunties. In Los Angeles or New York, you can't always count on a virgin bride. She may carry a bottle of tequila she likes to hide in the folds of her sari. Whether Muslim, Hindu, or Sikh, every knot's a risk. Nephews and uncles laugh out the ears, shout cheers, five cell phones per samosa. Close your eyes. You'll see a schoolboy pissing in the Ganges, hear okra-scented men shouting, taxi. Movies Hollywoodize the slum dogs, film shiny fabric stalls, Mosques and temples, selling blessings, taking bribes, cattle heavy roads, straddling rickshaws, Honda Civics, neighborhood kids playing cricket. Taj Mahal America. On a map, it may not exist, but last night I dreamt I was a professor sitting in some hole in the wall office, smoking shisha, writing a book on the hegemonic discourse of diasporic communities in America. Some would call it curious, some would call it kismet. Um, I'm sort of a grammar nerdette. So this next poem is kind of got all these grammar terms, like nerdy grammar terms. And um, I also majored in religious studies, so there's like references to different religions, and it's kind of a whimsical random poem called Sacred Grammar. 
Look at this Baptist semicolon wagging its tail at that hip hop comma. Page after page of Catholic periods, then this sassy Zen hyphen getting two words to kiss. The exposition shifts when ladylike mystics court masculine direct objects. Buddha preached nirvana but said little about exclamation points. The world's prophets have uttered their garden path sentences with the help of enlightened adverbs. Muslim fanboys haggle Jewish interjections at Salam Shalom foundations. Jesus is a noun, but the letter J has no part of speech. Some say God is a verb, but God's side is a preposition, as in, where did you put my petticoat? God side the laundry basket. As in, God side the Quran, there are no run on Hinduisms. Satan invented the ellipses point and asked this rhetorical question. Is it possible to make eye contact with an adjective without getting an erection? Once I winked at a Mormon who became a misplaced modifier. Once I danced the tango with an anachronistic pagan. Last month, I held a sentence fragment in my palm for 24 hours. It had no anchor in this great big world, no religion, no ethnicity, not even a gender. It turned cold on my palm and caught a fever then wandered into the gray abyss, no believer, an atheist. Um, this is sort of an, a surreal experimental poem. It's about a cloud, and it's called The Hot Dog Stand at Seven. I met a cloud outside the Iranian market on Reseda. He immediately bumped my hand and asked me out to dinner. The cloud, no sinner, held a cross in his grip. I sipped my cafe latte and said, can I think about it? Which kind of made him cringe, I think, because his fluffy sides seemed to clench. He looked like a rich cloud, and the rich, as you know, tend to boss when they speak. He reeked as well of sweet bread, the kind they serve at Christmas with pudding and fruit. Still, I was a bit impressed by his new suit, ironed and gray and quite structured for a cloud. The truth was, I felt afraid. There seemed to be a kind of stigma in the world about humans dating cumulus creatures. Their features were so abstract, like a Monet painting, and they were prone to fainting into spurts of rain. But no risk taking, no gain. So I said, sure, how about the hot dog stand at seven? Okay. Um, this poem focuses on an elephant. It's kind of a narrative poem. And like it's sort of syntactically, syntactically weird. Um, and I think I was reading a bunch of classic novels, or I was making a list of classic novels that I wanted to read, and somehow that got into the poem as well. And it's called Classic. We kissed and Frankenstein. I wore the gold necklace with the elephant pendant. We kissed and Madame Bovary. The elephant jingle jangled against my neck. It was 2 a.m. and LAX had never looked so historical. You held my hand and I held a tale of two cities. You said, that elephant's a sun against your dark skin. I grinned to withering heights. You wanted to know if the pendant was a gift? I knew what you were really asking. My ex was an entomologist. Had he been the one, it would have been a cockroach or a beetle. Not this matriarchal mammal. Not this gold miniature of hefty thighs. We embraced in pride and prejudice, my fears and Dracula. You said, it's a sin to call collect. I said, it's a sin to shoot an elephant. Our future was born in 1984, our world a cannery row of fishermen. It was 204 and LAX had never looked so intellectual. You asked me if you could keep the necklace while I was away, the little gold trunk and tusks and teeth but I would be the one boarding and departing, hovering over the good earth. I needed a totem. You said, our love is the totem. I opened my shoulder bag and handed you my leaves of grass. Your eyes misted over and you poked your chin with an index finger, dropped the book back inside my bag. I said, I'll chop off my hand, but I'm holding on to the pendant. It was 207 and LAX had never looked so metaphorical. I really need to get in line, I said. But you surprised me by reaching for my neck. A tug, a pull, an unhesitating yank, then the necklace in your grip. 
My mouth flew open. This elephant's a classic, you said, and I'm man enough to wear it. I stood still, stunned, handed you my carry-on bag. You fly then, I said. You board the goddamn plane. You speak at that conference in Chicago. You write the next great American dissertation. I'm going to the zoo. I hailed a taxi cab and didn't look back. That morning, gazing at a zebra, I decided losing the elephant pendant had been my karma. I'd probably been a hunter in some previous life. You'd probably flown to India to meet your match. The truth was, I'd bought the elephant to remind myself I was just an animal with veins. I could sing, loaf, and celebrate myself like a monkey or a penguin. LAX was naturally bisexual. It was only 12 minutes past Walt Whitman. Okay. And um, my last poem sort of ended up being about fashion. And um, it's called, A Monk Might Find Me Superficial. My friend, the editor, was dating a memoirist. He had written boldly about his liquor cabinet, spotting hummingbirds just south of Tucson. Over a salad lunch, she spoke on and on about their dates, the work of fate in bringing them together, their post-sex talks. Watching her pepper the bowl of lettuce in front of her, I thought of the yellow walls of my living room, which needed a fresh coat of paint. I thought of high school and college and how little I used my voice. My teen years and still, I could be passive as a trail of yarn. I asked questions, rarely answered them, and the whole world seemed to be rushing on, moving forward, while the destination was lost on me and I listened to the same songs. But the love poured out when I kissed a man, and years ago, while manicuring my nails red in a laundromat, I thought I was destined for the scarlet life. I went clothes shopping more deliberately from then on, and decided my closet wasn't just a functional space, but an argument being formed, each hanging garment a line of evidence. Every time we coordinate an outfit, I told my sister once, we are entering the debate. And though a monk might find me superficial, I would only agree on my green pump days. Most weeks, I shrine my walk in boot cut jeans. I listen to Paul Simon. I dress to succeed at the post office. Thanks, guys.